Genesis 27, we're calling this the stolen blessing. Genesis 20, 27 and 28 are really a single narrative. Chapter 28 will describe Jacob fleeing to Haran. And then 27 will tell us why he needed to flee to Haran because of this deception we have here. It really is a strange chapter and one that might leave us with more questions than answers. It's a fairly familiar story, the story of Jacob impersonating his brother to get the blessing. Acts 17.11 reminds us to receive the word with all eagerness, but we need to examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And sometimes this is no more important than it is when passages like this are so familiar to us. We need to take the time to dig deep to see what might be going on. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us and commands us to immerse ourselves in the words of Torah. Sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouths. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of Torah. Amen. So we'll talk about the theme of spiritual blindness. Oftentimes in the Bible, by, uh, uh, physical blindness is representative of spiritual blindness. We see that quite a lot in the Gospels. And it says here that Jacob uh, is unable to see, and he's also unable to see spiritually as well. Uh, I call this the great grifters of Genesis because we have uh, Rebecca and then Jacob pulling off this con of pretending to be someone else and very elaborate, thinking of every possible trap, and and they're kind of ready for it. So it's a, it really is a first-class grift if you think about it. Jacob is going to receive the, the blessing that was intended for Esau, but it's interesting. He's going to receive title, and it's very specifically land, air, and water title. We'll talk about what that means and the, the three different um, jurisdictions of law that we have there. Esau tends to have his own spin on things, which is not quite accurate. We'll look at that. And then he plots, and because of that, Jacob prepares to flee. Right away, we need to remember that the Bible's characters represent us. I think we can all relate to Isaac's spiritual blindness, Rebecca's impatience. Jacob is silent in the face of uh, opposition. He's, he's silent when he should have spoken up. And then Esau blamed others for what were his own choices. So I think an application point is to ask ourselves how we make similar mistakes anytime we choose a different path than God's plan, and especially if we have to resort to deceit or blaming others, then we know we're on the wrong wrong track. So let's learn from the uh, experiences of this family and strive to avoid repeating their errors. Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son, and he said to him, Hineni, here am I. Then Isaac said, Behold now, I am old and do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow. Go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare a delicious meal for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. So this is a clear failure of Isaac. He, he is spiritually blind. He's unable to see Esau's true character and unable to see that Jacob is the legitimate spiritual heir. And as we talked about last time, there so far have been at least three confirmations that the firstborn blessing should have gone to Jacob and not Esau. When first Rebekah was told the older shall serve the younger, an oracle directly from, from God himself. Second, Jacob had a legally binding agreement that Esau forfeited the firstborn status. And then third, Esau married from the cursed line of the Canaanites. Despite being forbidden to do so by Abraham, uh, and you know Isaac will later forbid Jacob from doing the same. So you know why is Esau allowed to do this and he still gets the firstborn? I don't, I don't think so. Lancaster reminds us that fathers often take pride in their children's physical achievements. So maybe they get good grades or maybe they're good in sports, but it's more important to focus on their children's spiritual maturity and character. And here Isaac is you know, kind of enamored with Esau's ability to hunt and, and gather uh, and kind of ignores his major, major uh, deficits. We talked about literal blindness as a type of spiritual blindness, and we see this quite a bit in the Gospels. This is actually the first event in Genesis of what will become a series of fake identities and deception. It kind of kicks off here. Ultimately, Joseph will conceal his own identity from his brothers, and so when we think of Joseph as a type of Messiah, there were lots of times where Jesus had to heal someone who was physically blind, and that represented the spiritual blindness of the nation. 
And so we could say that these events, uh, as, as one commentator said, portend the coming of Messiah, a son of Isaac, whose identity was also concealed from the eyes of the nation. Matthew 13, therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Luke 19, on his way uh, down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, says, if you had known on this day, even you, the conditions for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. This picture is a, a, a rendition of the pilgrims on the road to Emmaus. And remember, Jesus taught them everything about himself, but they were blind. Luke 24, 16, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. We need to remember that in Romans 11, Paul tells us that national blindness was imposed by God himself. Romans 11, 25, I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So perhaps in the same way, God imposed a blindness on Isaac to accomplish his purpose. You know, perhaps Jacob was a homebody and would not have gone to Haran to take uh, wives from his family the way the way Isaac, Isaac did. Um, but you know, we don't know. But there must be a reason for this. Uh, God, God will use everything for good in His purposes. Now Rebecca was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, "Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a delicious meal for me, so that I may eat." and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. One nice thing about the Bible is that we don't need to feel too bad if our families are really, really messed up. The Bible absolutely tells it like it is. When things weren't going the way Sarah wanted, she suggested Abraham uh, take Hagar and really help God along. And I think we have kind of something similar happening here. Rebecca's trying to help God out. Rebecca knows the promise, uh, but you know this, it seems like it's not happening. And so let's let's see what we can do. This is really a classic case when you hear the expression, the ends don't justify the means. So we wanted a right outcome. We wanted Jacob to be blessed, but we had a very poor strategy to get there. And sinning to do God's will is just an obvious contradiction. And yet this is what they do here. Despite having all of the blessings, you know, the first family consistently fails to act on faith. So now my son, listen to me as I command you. And those are the Hebrew words Shema and Sava, which means she's not making a suggestion here. She's saying, obey me. I'm giving, I'm giving you an order. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there so that I may prepare them as a delicious meal for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat, so he may bless you before his death. Jacob, apparently having some doubts about this, said to his mother, Rebekah, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will touch me, and then I will be like a deceiver in his sight, which absolutely he is, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get the goats for me. So by issuing a direct order, Rebecca has really put Jacob in a tough position because either he obeys the one parent and disrespects the other, or he disobeys one in order to respect the other. And again, the situation is more complicated because God has already ordained the outcome. But as we said, the ends don't justify the means. Jacob really should have spoken up here because righteous individuals speak out against wrongdoings. Rebecca says, uh, may the curse be on me, and her household will actually be a train wreck after this. This is you know, the, the beginning of a very, very bad situation for the family. Um, Rebecca will never see Jacob again after this day, and so she loses a son, basically. Rebecca, I, I see an opportunity for her to reason with Isaac, and yet she doesn't do that. So while their sons were out capturing animals, she could have gone in and said, you know, God told me. Um, but but you know, we have to wonder why she, she didn't. So our walking in his dust is we don't do any wrong to a neighbor. Jacob and Rebecca wronged their father Isaac. Isaac wronged Jacob by not blessing him from the start and really putting him, you know, putting him in this position. And then later at the end of the chapter, we're going to see that Esau harbored thoughts of murdering Jacob. So this is just bad news all the way around. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually paraphrased, paraphrased a famous rabbi who lived a few decades before him. And when Jesus said, whatever you wish others would do to you, do to them, that's the golden rule. That former rabbi turned it around a little bit. He said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. And I think that's the sense that we need to, uh, to remember here. Jacob not only did wrong to a neighbor, but that neighbor was also his father. So let us uh, never do to others that which is hateful to us. 
Romans 13, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So Jacob went and got the goats and brought them to his mother, and his mother made a delicious meal such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the, in the house, and she put them on her younger son Jacob, and she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. She also gave the delicious meal and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. So this is just, they're going all out on this grift here. And it's very interesting that Jacob will later himself be deceived by the by the goat, and that's specifically the blood of a goat by his own children. Then he came to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who are you, my son? <laughs> Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Come now and sit, eat of my game, so that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God has made it come to me. So in a way, Jacob risked blowing the entire operation uh, when his fake Esau attributed his quick success to God, because based on what we know, the real Esau would never have attributed any success to God. Esau lived entirely in the flesh. So Isaac is not convinced here. Isaac says to Jacob, and perhaps it was the comment about giving God the glory that uh, you know gave gave room for suspicion. Please come so that come close so that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob came close to his father Esau and touched him and said, "The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau." And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him and he said, "Are you really my son Esau?" And he said, "I am." So we have this literary moment of tension here. Will, will our flawed hero Jacob be cursed or, or you know, will he be found out or, or will he actually be blessed? So he said, bring it to me and I will eat of my son's games that I may bless you. And he brought it to him and he ate and he also brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, please come and kiss me, my son. So it looks like it's working out, but we can almost feel these long pauses of silence as Isaac takes a bite. He's elderly, so he's eating slowly. He takes a sip of wine, pauses, takes another bite, and then another sip. This whole ordeal must have just been agonizing for, for Jacob. Because in addition to, they need Isaac to fall for this con, they also need Esau not to come back. Because if Esau had shown up at any point, then you know, the, then the whole thing would have, would have been blown. So he's still not ready to bless his son. Isaac begs Esau to come closer. There's one final confirmation that Isaac needs. Fortunately, Jacob has anticipated the sniff test and the, the blessing ensues. So he came close and kissed him. When he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field in which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and abundance of grain and new wine. May peoples serve you and nations bow down before you. Be master of your brothers. And may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be those who, who bless you. So this blessing uh, of Ab Genesis 12 to Abraham is really reiterated to Jacob. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Remember back in the early chapters of Genesis that Adam was given dominion over the land and the sea and the air. And we actually have a, a form of that here. Jacob is given dominion over the land with the blessing of fertility with olive trees, crops, and vineyards. So when it says fatness, nutritional fat in Hebrew is really the same word for olives and olive oil. So we've got olive trees and then grain, wheat, barley, and then uh, vineyards for new wine. Dominion over the seas is like a, a commercial transaction. So nations are going to come and bow down to him. And also nations and Gentiles are all, all often portrayed in the Bible as the sea. So may the people serve you and the nations bow down to you. And finally, given dominion over the air, well, that's, that's trust law. And so he's being placed as the head over the family trust. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. 
Uh, and so we see all of these, these things here. Also, whenever you see brain, uh, bread and grain and wine all together, that should get your attention. And then here we have the addition of oil, which speaks of anointing. So in addition to this immediate prosperity for Jacob, this blessing is clearly looking forward to the Messianic era, which of course will come uh, through Jacob's line. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had hardly gone from the presence of his father Isaac that his brother Esau came in from hunting. Then he also made a delicious meal and brought it to his father and he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Now, ruh -roh. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who then was he who hunted game and brought it to me, so that I ate from it all before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me as well, my father. Some speculate here that Isaac may have trembled violently because it was at this moment he realized God forced him to bless Jacob. In other words, it was God's doing. He realized he had been acting outside of God's will. I don't know that I see that given the next verse, but it is an, an option to think about. Ancient oaths and blessings were binding. In fact, the blessing to Jacob was really in the form of an oracle. And so there are no do-overs. You can't take it back. Once it's out there, it's out there. Esau, which is interesting here, begins to snivel like a pouting child, but he's at least kind of at the old, at the youngest, he's a middle-aged man, well over 40, and possibly according to one calculation, both Esau and Jacob are in their 70s at this point. So that adds a different dynamic to this discussion. And he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then Esau said, is he not rightly named Yaakov? For he has betrayed me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. So we got some fake news spin going on there. He didn't actually take away your, your birthright. And he said, how have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied uh, to Esau, be so, behold, I have made him your master and I've given him all and all his relatives as servants. And with grain and new wine, I have sustained him. What can I do for you, my son? Yeah, that's kind of ouch. Uh, so Isaac is being half factual here in verse 35. Um, and then the, the rest of the story is that Esau, Isaac was supposed to bless Jacob and not Esau in the first place. So partially deceit, but partially uh, Isaac blew it here. And then again, and Isaac, Esau is also guilty of some selective editing here. Jacob didn't take away the birthright. Esau gave it up. In a backhanded way, though, this reference reminds Isaac that Jacob actually deserved the blessing. He deserved the blessing of the firstborn. Uh, Isaac says the terms were immediate upon execution. Jacob is your master now. Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me as well, my father. So Esau raised his voice and wept. Then his father Isaac answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, kind of the opposite, and away from the dew of the heaven from above, so no, no blessing from the rain. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, but it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from his neck. So uh, Esau raised his voice, and to me that's another indication of Esau's unworthiness because regardless of the circumstance, Raising your voice at your father just would have been unacceptable in the ancient world. And so uh, Esau is kind of, again, proving his unworthiness here. Isaac prophesied subjugation and violence for Esau. Not exactly what uh, Esau hoped to hear, although eventually uh, his freedom is promised. Lest we have any sympathy for Esau, you know, remember he's re reaping the results of despising his birthright. The writer to Hebrews emphasizes this. Hebrews 12, 16, that there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. So God really orchestrated all of this, uh, maybe not the way God would have wanted it with the man-made deception, but in the end, um, Esau was not going to be the one to be blessed. So Esau held the grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father Esau had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of my mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, 
she sent word and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. The chapter 28 break might really have been after, might have been better placed after verse 40 or 41, but we'll go ahead and finish chapter 27 as we have it. Esau, again, should be mad at himself for selling his birthright so cheaply, but you know that's human nature, and we always want to blame someone else for our troubles. Interestingly enough, Isaac won't die for many, many years, and we'll see later that Jacob and Esau come together to bury him. So um, he was going to have to wait a long time and hold on to his grudge for a while. So then Rebekah says, my son, obey my voice, arise and flee to Haran to my brother Laban, stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you did to him. <laughs> Thanks mom, uh, what you did to him. Uh, then I will send my word and get you uh, from there. Why should I use you both in one day? So this odd behavior of Rebecca continues, very strange thing to say what you did to him, you know, passing the buck and you're on your own kid. Um, but this fleeing to Laban, you know, surely she would have known of Laban, Laban's deception and chicanery. Um, and it's really kind of an odd hiding place because Esau is very likely to find out where Jacob is hiding. And in fact, he does in 28. And, and so he learns that Jacob is, is fleeing to Haran. Rebecca is also pretty naive as she thinks Esau is going to forget about this because what she expects to last maybe, you know, a few days or at least less than a year turns out to be more than two decades. Jacob will be exiled here. And interestingly enough, Esau becomes symbolic of Rome. So the Romans become known as the Edomites and, and from the tribe of Esau. Because of the Roman Esau, the people were exiled for nearly two millennia. So they see a connection there between Jacob, who was later named Israel, and, uh, and Esau as Rome. Uh, lose you both may refer to Esau killing Jacob, you know, resulting in Esau fleeing um, or, or being brought to justice somehow. It can also refer to losing Isaac and Jacob, you know, where Isaac in his weakened state happened to, uh, you know, if he collapsed after hearing that his, his uh, son Jacob had died. You know, we just don't know. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth, so the Hittites. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Chapter 28, verse 1. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, saying to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And then we'll pick up the rest of that story next time when we get to Genesis 28. I think it's noteworthy that Abraham sent a servant to fetch a bride for Isaac, but Isaac uh, sent his own son to fetch his own bride. You know, you go get it yourself, get her yourself. And so it's interesting that uh, he blessed Jacob even after all this went down and then, and then sends him away. So pretty fascinating. And so back to our main application for this chapter, like all of these people are a picture of us. We can be spiritually blind, we can be impatient, we can be silent, we don't speak, speak up when we should, and then we can be deceiving like Jacob, and then we can be fleshly like Esau. So we'll pick up next time the continuing saga of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 28. So we'll see you next time.